Hello and good evening everybody. Welcome to another session of questions and queries related to graphology. As we have more people coming online and we have inquisitive minds wanting to ask questions, we shall certainly look at the various topics and eventually we will come to conclusions, we will come to the reality of uh, how things are. Okay, so I'll just open up my list of questions which I've already received. All right. Okay, so the first question here is that uh, does the type of pen change the nature of how you write? Like if you're using a ballpoint pen or a gel pen or a fountain pen, ink pen, sketch pen, there's so many types of nibs that are uh, available in the market. So yes, the different types of nibs can influence the, the effect of how you write, but that effect wears out after a couple of lines. So once your hand is set with a certain pen, once it knows how it feels, then ultimately it starts to reveal the character. So normally what happens is that if we have, let's say, a, a paragraph of a text, let's say six to seven lines paragraph, we just check the first two lines if there's any, any odd contrast. Maybe the pen is not something that the person was used to. Normally he's used to writing with a fountain pen and today we gave him a ballpoint pen. So maybe that change must have affected him slightly, but it doesn't affect too much. And if your character is a certain behavior, if your habits, actions are of a certain way, then the nature of the handwriting will always be the same. Of course, the intention of writing, the, the nature of the writing, the, the inten intention and how you feel while you write can also influence the writing that feeling can be influenced by the type of pen that you use also. So let's say, for example, if I use a standard uh, pencil or a pen, which, I mean, it doesn't cost too much and it's fine, then this is where we see that uh, it can be an ordinary experience of writing. But if you have a really expensive pen, you know, you spend a good amount of money on it and it looks classy and nice, there's a bit of a flair and a passion of writing which you can acquire from that instrument. But of course, once you get used to that, then again, it's just another pen. So yes, type of pen can affect the way you uh, write, but not to a major extent. An experienced graphologist knows how to overlook this uh, lacuna. Okay. So the next question is, uh, is it better to co collect a sample on a blank page or a ruled paper? So let's understand what the mindset is when you write on a blank paper on a ruled paper. Firstly, a blank paper represents an open space for the mind to express without any uh, confinement, without any rules, regulations, without anybody looking down on you. It's like an open book. Write whatever you want. The mind is free. But when a person writes on a lined paper where you have to follow the lines, then although he's writing whatever comes to his mind, but there's a certain set system, there's a certain way to write it. And there's certain rules which are attached to it. So let's take for example, we normally take two samples of the writing when we are doing recruitment analysis. We want, let's say if I'm the boss of a company and I want to know how my employee behaves. How is his behavior in real life? In the company, how he behaves and outside how he behaves because my company's reputation is depending on the good nature of my employees. So let's take for example, when I see his lined paper, uh, sample that's when I see how he'll behave in the office or in the regulated environment and the blank paper will show me how he behaves 
outside i mean where there's nobody watching him there are no rules and regulations so this comparison can give me as an employer a good tool for gauging the nature of my employee it could be employee it could be business partner it could be a new employee it could be an old employee it can be uh, you can have a friends analysis to be done that way you can have a, a let's say a study partner it could be anything where you want to know how the person behaves in an organization and without any rules both ways so blank and rule paper are useful either way okay now the next, next question is how does the analysis differ if the analyzer is having a connected or disconnected writer so connected writing means that the person has got smooth flow of thought they are able to uh, connect one thought after the other in a very smooth fashion and it's like a story they remember things in the form of a story whereas disconnected writing people their mind they also remember things but it's not necessarily in a story form is just like random facts in their mind or this creative thought pattern in their mind which have got no correlation but somehow they are able to remember things so you know uh, like when i say the when i say this word jack and jill went up the hill now the moment i said this phrase your mind automatically goes around with that nursery rhyme but if you have i mean that was for the connected writing if you have disconnected writing and i have say jack and jill went up the hill you say okay jack and jill went up the hill to buy a ferrari so now they'll go and go to the moon you see it could be any random thought because there's no correlation there's just randomness it's like having a conversation with a child it's very difficult to stick to one topic while you're having a conversation with a child i mean 6 7 year old child okay next question is what part in handwriting shows the high imagination of a person well high imagination now there are two ways to interpret it does he have a high quality of imagination or is he imagining too many things okay overthinking so high man- imagination where the person is deep into one single thought that is where the opposition goes tall now if he's got too many ideas and he's got too many random thoughts too much imagination of random things then the upper zone goes wide so the upper zone of the writing like let's say let the l the upper zone of letter h d k f the higher zone of these letters the height will show the depth of the person's imagination like how deep he goes into one thought and contemplates on it and the wide one shows how many multiple thoughts are being thought about over a period of time okay all right so next one next question here we have over here is uh, all right next is some writers have a disconnected handwriting but their signature will be running okay so you have a paragraph which has got disconnected writing but a signature which has got fluent writing connected fluent writing so character is seen from a paragraph and the signature shows personality character is who you are personality is what you choose to show so as a character this person who's got disconnected writing in the paragraph intrinsically he is a creatively instinctive person very creative intuitively sharp person but he would like to show a personality where he can have smooth conversation then he can be talkative he can be uh, having good flow of thought so it's a choice you can choose to have a show of a personality which you want based on your decision it's your signature you have got complete control and authority to represent yourself the best way you feel is possible in a signature so for that that's why we see that the signature is a representative of a personality you can't judge the person too much based on the choice of personality they want to show you because that's not who they are really but again over a period of time if you use a signature for a long time then that personality also becomes a part of your character 
which can uh, make life a bit complicated, especially if the signature and the actual handwriting sample have got very varied observations. Okay, next question is uh, how how we can find a person with poor concentration in the writing. Well, poor concentration or poor focus is normally when the letters become a bit flat. You see, when let's say you have letter O and the letter O is normally having width and height almost at the same. But if it looks flattened, if your handwriting looks a bit flattened or certain letter structures are becoming flattened, it shows that the person is not able to focus well. Irregular middle zone can show lack of focus. Irregular spacing can show lack of focus. There are multiple thought patterns of how the person loses concentration and at the same time, uh, what topic the person loses concentration about, that also can be understood. Okay. All right. So then thank you very much for the question. It's really interesting. It's uh, fun to come online and answer to you all. I hope you all are enjoying this session. We have finished so far 12th session and this is the 13th session. And if you revise all the previous ones and ahead whatever be published, you'll get quite a lot of information about graphology. Okay. So thank you for tuning in and let's continue with the next question. So here we have a question. If the crossbar of the T is very high, what does it reveal? So a T crossbar, the crossbar for T structure shows how your mentality perceives a goal. Okay. So let's take, for example, a person who earns, let's say, a, a thousand rupees a month. Okay. Let's take, for example, thousand rupees a month. And he wants to buy a 5,000 rupees cell phone. So it's an achievable goal if he makes savings accordingly. Okay. Now, let's say he wants to buy a 20,000 rupee phone from a 1,000 rupee income per month. Now, that goal seems to be quite lofty and probably a fortune will be able to make that work. Or a very long duration of patience of saving and saving. Probably by the time you finish saving that much amount, maybe a new mobile will come out. So the thing is that when the higher the crossbar, the more fancy a goal looks, but then the reality essence of it, the achievability of the goal becomes extremely difficult. It's very nice to dream and think about, eh, one day I'll have a Mercedes. Yeah, one day I'll have a five bedroom bungalow. It's very nice to dream about these things, but then to make it a goal, that's a completely different ball game. So, as the crossbar goes higher, your goal becomes more dreamy. It becomes lofty. It becomes close to unachievable. So you have to be careful. Your crossbar should be in the upper zone, but as close to the middle zone. That is what I will allow it to have the nature of the goal to be realistic. And in my opinion, I feel it's better to have a realistic goal which you can achieve and move forward step by step rather than having one big lofty goal and never having a end of sight of when it's going to be achieved. If you ask a person, I'm going to buy, a, a, let's say, a car which a medium, medium cost car, it's achievable. It's within the reach. But if you say an ultra luxury car and your lifestyle and your income doesn't match it, then obviously that becomes a dream. Okay. So unless you are really lucky or you really put yourself into a good system of work, a dream remains a dream. It's not easy to make it a goal. Okay. Okay. Lovely question. Next. Uh, are there any pre prerequisites for learning mystic graphology? So first of all, the nature of mystic graphology, which I have uh, developed myself is to give the graphologist a skill to analyze the person in front of them just by the way they have written their name. So what happens is that 
there are times when you're in a restaurant or you're at a uh, pub or you're in a party you're in meeting somebody and you don't have a paper and pen as much but they want to experience sanity analysis now they take out a tissue paper and scribble their name if they give you the name of the, i mean their own name and if you know mystic graphology you will be able to analyze at least 40 to 50 different points about this person and they will be all accurate and there's a almost there's almost a predictive nature of graphology in mystic graphology because you can project certain things about this person in the future based on what he's written today so if you want to learn mystic graphology you need to go through macro graphology micro graphology diagnostic graphology graphotherapy and once you go through these le levels in academic graphology can be useful even uh, quick graphology can be useful there are multiple courses which i conduct normally mystic graphology is a course which the student is going to learn after they finish all these courses and normally i select students who want to learn mystic graphology i don't teach it to everybody because the caliber of analysis required to do good mystic analysis is uh, something which uh, I really re require before I teach. So, mystic graphology is fun. It's got a mind-boggling level of skill, amazing sharpness, amazing confirmed analysis points. But the price that you have to pay for it in terms of skill is very strong. Okay. So you have to make sure that you are uh, well versed with macro and micro graphology at least and then go ahead with mystic all right thank you next intelligent people have a bad handwriting how true is this well intelligent people are called intelligent because they think fast they calculate fast they are able to reach a solution to a problem faster than ordinary minds. So intelligence is all about reaching the goal of a thought, reaching the goal of an answer as quickly as possible and as creatively as possible also. Now what happens is that when you write something, there's a limited way, there's a limited speed at which you can write. So when you have a brilliant flash of an idea and you've got You've got amazing things to think about and you want to pen them down. So your hand is just not fast enough to write. So when we say intelligent people have bad handwriting, yes, they can have bad handwriting. Bad handwriting means what? Illegibility. The, the nature of the handwriting's illegible structures are quite high. But that's the point that when a person has a brilliant idea and they write something that's not meant to be analyzed it's just a download the person has the person has had a eureka moment or something he wants to write something he's intelligent but when the person is giving you a sample for writing and then if they have an illegible bad handwriting even when they had all the time in the world then that is where the person is not necessarily using his intelligence but just being careless Intelligent people know when to slow down. They know when things are relaxed. Intelligence doesn't mean only doing fast thoughts or fast uh, thought patterns. It can be about just uh, slowing down also. So, when as far as intelligence is concerned, yes, sometimes we see ba bad quality handwriting, but it's not a compulsion, especially if you are having a sample for analysis. Okay, next question. While writing capital P, if the loop of P does not touch the vertical line, what does it reveal? I think this question's answer is there in my YouTube channel letter P video. So if you have letter P when the curve doesn't touch the line, means that the body language that you want to develop and the muscle memory that you want to develop is not going to be as uh, easy as you thought it was and the nature of your effort to do it is also not going to be very productive normally when a person has a p where the it's broken it's not touching 
these people when they play table tennis or badminton or any sports they are always bad at it and they never get good at it they try to do dancing they they had multiple teachers but nobody really got them to dance properly something about them just doesn't make them have good body language or good body muscle memory which makes them want to uh, you know just perform well if you have a closed feel at a structure then yes it can increase the chances of you being good at sports and dance and any physical activity which requires muscle memory okay so the next question here is how can you see if a person loves you from the handwriting <laughs> so if you want to know if a person loves you just go and ask them don't look for the handwriting it will be very it will be a very odd thing to know that you somebody cares for you from a handwriting you can just look at their face or just ask them and they will tell you directly but if you still want clues about this then you must realize that graphology has its limitations love and spirituality are essence or certain experiences of the human life where it is beyond graphology why because graphology is a dualistic concept now pure love genuinely good love and spirituality and joy these factors of life are singular concepts means that there is no differentiation in those thought patterns it's like let's take for example if you see a slightly crippled child uh, in front of you you say oh so sad the child's hand is not good leg is awkward but that child's mother what she thinks i don't care how my child is i love my child no matter what so that kind of love which is without any any dualism just i care for you i don't care what happens i don't care how you look i don't care what's your difficulty don't worry i care for you so that mindset is different because it's above graphology's dualistic nature it cannot be seen in the writing but yes you can develop yourself with the help of graphology to achieve that level of consciousness or that level of experience of life where if somebody cares for you it's genuine if your spiritual path is activated then it should be genuine if you have a joy around you where you have children and family and things go on and this life is beautiful then that can be worked upon through handwriting to reach that goal but of course once you reach that goal then suddenly the dualistic nature of handwriting no longer is a requirement okay now the thing is that if you want clues anyway so what we normally tell a person to do is uh let's say we have a uh a, a person named john okay john is a good friend of mine and i want to know in his friend circle who he cares about more so i tell him to write a list of his friends names huh? so mary jessica um philip and let's say five six names are there and uh, all male female and he, you want to know who who he cares about the most now in this list of names if you see any weird or any sudden fluctuation of pressure or slant or zone or spacing then that word has got a trigger point of maybe some emotion now what it exactly is it's very difficult for me to teach you here but in my macro graphology course i teach this how you can detect these fine changes in the writing which can give you clues about what the person's preference is now it could be to find out a person's uh friendship with another person it could be maybe you want to find out what's his favorite sweet dish you give him a list of sweet dishes to write and the one which pops out the most is probably his favorite then if what if the person has got a you want to gift something to the person on his birthday and he gives you <clears throat> and he gives you a list of things that he would like to have there will be one item which is written very peculiarly so you have clues about it so yes handwriting can reveal preferences through 
certain uh, observation techniques but not directly if the person loves you or not that's not easy and honestly if somebody cares about you they should just tell you directly okay so the next question is uh, uh all right where did i learn graphology from so i have learned graphology from many many sources from the year 2005 to 2009 i had multiple teachers but although i do respect them i was horribly annoyed with all of them because what used to happen was that if i would ask a question of why certain things work in a certain way why this trait has this outcome so they would always divert my question with uh, silly responses like you learn later come back later now you're just too young uh, it's a very high level of knowledge you won't understand so there were a lot of divergent tactics tactics rather than just saying the direct answer and i appreciate those teachers who say directly okay i don't know the answer your question is brilliant but i don't know the answer that is appreciated but then when the teacher doesn't know the answer or they know the answer but they just divert you away from a risk a clear answer that is what something that ticked me off so from around let's say 2008 2009 i started developing a certain way of analyzing handwriting in my own way based on geometric patterns which i teach in micrographology and mystigraphology so the nature of what i teach is mostly my own uh, pioneering work some of the topics which i teach are from my past teachers and uh, if it works i respect it if it doesn't work if it's got no logical thought pattern in it and it doesn't make sense then i don't uh, teach it all right so the next question is uh, is it possible to become disciplined by practicing graphotherapy yes discipline is one of the most crucial factors of any form of success in life whether you want success in a job or whether you want success in a um in a let's say academics or relations or in for yourself you want to take care of your body a bit better okay so if you want any form of success discipline is the most important ground base on which you have to build everything discipline works with integrity they are both hand in hand so discipline can be improved with graphotherapy and i've got wonderful written and non written techniques for you to practice with graphotherapy so that you can increase your discipline yes all right next question is uh, what does it mean when h has a wider angle in the bottom and goes into an angular hump instead of a rounded one so if you have a h which looks like a sharp sharpened angle like a very jagged now if you are a person solving mathematical problems or doing some scientific evaluations and some really technical study then this h is going to be very good for you it helps to remain sharp it helps you to uh, avoid wasting time there is a certain impatience in impatience in scientists which makes them drive forward towards answers which they seek so if you have so if you have a sharp edge a very sharp jagged edge it's a good complement during technical studies or some technical thought patterns but if you are having edge and your life is mostly docile and normal normal family life normal job business travel whatever then this edge will make you a person who is slightly annoying and easy to annoy if i had this kind of a edge i would expect you to learn as fast as i teach rather than learn understanding your pace of learning these people have less patience with people around them so if you get 
if you inter- if you are interacting with a with a sharp edge person and if you understand him quickly at his pace he is fine but as soon as you ask him to repeat or you like i don't understand what he's saying and the communication there's a gap this person is going to get very easily annoyed sharp letter as people find it slightly difficult to maintain relations for long time and even if they have long term relations they are not really good okay the warmth of a relationship tends to get destroyed or subdued with a sharp edge okay because your communication with other people who are close to you becomes a bit pointy sharp all right next is uh, okay so lovely questions really exciting questions so what my mind is like there's a there's a workout happening in my mind right now it feels so active and so alive with the amazing questions all right how did graphology come into my life graphology came into my life as a, a random chance i had no clue of what graphology was when i heard of it and when i heard of it when i went to the first lecture where i learned i didn't know what to expect and i thought it was i mean i had a scientific aptitude and i thought okay this is just going to be some hocus pocus let's see what's going to happen i mean maybe just a couple of i mean little money will go in learning in but let's see what it is so i learned a bit of graphology and i started practicing and then you know sometimes you find something in your life which you get naturally good at and then fortunately i found out that graphology was one thing which i was naturally able to pick up very quickly some people can pick up a violin and play it very easily like as if they know it some people can learn a language like it as if it's just the part of them so everybody's got their own hidden talent which if they discover they know that they can get it easily so fortunately very very fortunately graphology seems to have um uh, been a natural phenomenon in me and since the last 16 years now this is the 17th year i'm just enjoying my journey whether it's teaching graphology whether it's analysis of a writing or correcting somebody's signature or designing a new concept for new letter structures it's just uh, it's just a complete joy for me okay all right so now the next question is which type of therapy and how much time does it take to overcome the indiscipline so uh, based on the techniques which i have suggested you can overcome your indiscipline within 30 days or 90 days depending on your focus of the practice of what i suggest and your intention of practice so if your intention is particular and sharp and you know why you are wanting to get discipline discipline needs a reason otherwise you will never be disciplined if you don't have a strong why reason discipline will never work so from indiscipline to discipline you need a strong why reason so if a why reason becomes strong then discipline comes naturally and that's what graphotherapy tries to provoke in you the nature of my graphotherapy is to provoke a strong why reason in you so when you have a strong reason to do things then your discipline increases it takes around 30 days to 90 days depending on your practice how can you work on procrastination through graphology well procrastination is a fancier way to say you're indisciplined so just have a strong reason why you're doing something and procrastination automatically gets sorted out the waiting game automatically gets sorted out you'll be able to be on time you'll be disciplined punctual and you strike when the iron is hot correctly what does incomplete signature reveal incomplete signature normally i've seen this people have a desire to be mysterious and they feel it's a compliment that you don't know everything about me 
I'll reveal some things about you, and the rest of me is a mystery. So the people have uh, some kind of a fun and a joy of being mysterious. So being mysterious for the sake of being mysterious is, uh, I mean, there's a certain entertainment value in it, but then there's no depth in the personality or the character. Mysterious people don't go around telling them, telling everybody that they're mysterious. So, when you have an incomplete signature, it shows that the person is either trying to be mysterious when he's not really a big deal enough for that purpose, or he could be hiding certain factors of his life which he doesn't want people to know about. Okay. okay. All right. So, what is the effect of writing letter O backwards on personality? So, if you write the O clockwise or anti-clockwise, there's not much of a difference. If you write it, let's say, the standard way, okay, anti-clockwise. Anti-clockwise O is where you think about the past and then you think about the future, okay? But... In the clockwise O, when we go clockwise, we think about the future first and then the past. So the sequence of the thought pattern changes, but the overall nature of the thought almost remains the same. Letter O is about completion. Letter O is about the thought pattern that makes you think about completing things. So whether you think about the past first and then the future, or whether you think about the future or the past then later, that all depends on the way you write O, but ultimately it's all about completion of thought. Next question. Does graphology help to perform Im improve performance in sports? Well, it depends on what level of sports you're talking about. If you're talking about a casual game, you're just playing some badminton in a local court and you, you don't really care about making your game better, then graphology won't make much of a deal because the physical strength and stamina which you require will come from the practice of badminton itself. But if you want to be a champion, if you want to be a state level champion, country level champion, world level or Olympic champion, then you need a certain mindset along with the physical effort that you make. Because the difference between an ordinary player and a world class champion is the mind. The way the mind works while they practice their jogging, running, badminton, and whatever sports they play. That's where graphology can make a huge difference to the psychology of the person. So as far as physicality is concerned, graphology can have a, let's say, a 10% influence on you, where it can just make your body language better, which can ultimately make your performance better. But if you Think about the mental and emotional impact on the sports performance. Then graphology can have a huge impact. It can make the most impact where you can change from a normal player to the higher uh, achievers, like a champion. Okay. All right. So what happens when the O has a loop? at the lower end. So now this question requires me to have a diagram of what your question is. So if you could send me your query to my WhatsApp number, I'm just writing my WhatsApp number in the chat box over here. You can send me a picture of your uh, letter structure you want to talk about and I'll be happy to answer it for you. Or you can join my micrographology course or you can look at a O letter structure video on my YouTube channel and you can get the, uh, the explanation. Yeah, so please send me the description, the diagram of the letter structure. Explaining it sometimes can go into a misunderstanding. All right, so this has been amazing. We've got a good 20 minutes left. Let's carry on. So we have another question here. If I want to improve my spiritual journey, how do I improve it with graphology when graphology has nothing to do with it? 
so spiritual journey yes you once you are a person who once you reach a certain level of spiritual realization you won't need graphology the journey takes you on automatically but to reach that level you have to deal with the difficulties or the challenges with earth gives you the mental emotional physical state of being need to be in harmony before you reach a spiritual level now sometimes people are naturally gifted and some blessing from above comes and they become spiritually inclined without any much of an effort but then ordinary people who want to experience another dimension of life another another aspect of life graphology can help you sort out the earth things like food and money and physicality and all those things so that you, once you let go of the uh, material then the spiritual nature of you can be a little more uh, highlighted okay all right so if you'd like to have the details of my courses please connect with me my email address and my contact number is below the video below this video's description after this video is over you can have a look at it or you can just message me on the whatsapp number i'll send you the details and uh, normally what happens is that when you learn graphology you never know what you're getting yourself into it almost feels like a magic show but once you know graphology then it's a life skill because then you can take care of who is around you and what kind of people you you want to have around you while you deal with life okay so the next question here is where how many graphologists are there what is the competition of graphology there are many graphologists in the world i think there are thousands of them i mean, i'm not i'm not sure because i'm so busy trying to do my own work i'm not i'm not really going to see how many graphologists are there but i have interacted with graphologists from many different countries and they've got beautiful concepts give beautiful thought patterns which uh, they <clears throat> they work with and it's amazing to see the variations all right so i have a letter structure here which a person has sent i'll just show it on my screen over here can you see this screen okay so this is the letter o which was shared with one of the audience members here so now this letter o is where it starts from here and then it goes around and then there's an ending stroke kind of a loop this kind of a o shows that the person instead of completing things which he has full control over this person hopes that completion is a manifestation it's like you know these people would want things to work out not necessarily with their direct effort but they hope things will work out so if you are a let's say it's like you're trying to earn money from a lottery then this will work but then how many tickets are you going to buy and how much time are you going to spend when you can just directly do work and earn the money which you are supposed to earn you got capability you got skill go and earn the money so when you are fully capable of earning money but yet you are waiting for a lottery ticket to give you a good life that's when this kind of a o happens these people will normally use uh manifestation as a escape from actually just doing the work and completing things which they can do okay so now if you know a person who has this kind of oh, please connect with them talk to them please come back to me clarify whether i have said something right or wrong if you if i have said something right if it matches the thought pattern then okay if it doesn't match the thought pattern i would like to talk to the person and understand where i've gone wrong because 
this is the first time I've seen this letter structure. I had to calculate the geometric pattern and say it live to you. So I've never seen this structure before, and I hope my analysis comes out correct. It should come out correct if the geometric analysis is correct. All right. All right. So next is uh, other than practicing, which quality makes you an excellent graphologist? All right. So apart from the normal practice of graphology, if you want to be a good graphologist, you need to have a couple of things. First of all, you need to realize that you don't know anything. What you know is very small. What you experience is very small. And if you realize that there's always something new to learn, then you'll be open-minded enough to be a good graphologist. Because what you may find normal in your character essence, in your habits essence, in that handwriting sample, you might find it completely odd. But that doesn't mean that it is wrong, it's just that it's different. So I think graphology has made me accept the, the genius of human humanity where so many people have so many different thought patterns and I can learn from them and expand my mind because I'm learning their stories. I don't need to go through the difficulty of the experiences, but I can get the re result of the experiences. And that gives me a big boost in terms of expanding my mind and in terms of thought patterns. So if you are from a tight community where you only interact with certain type of people, talk to certain type of people, graphology is going to be very limited to you unless you open up your mind to different possibilities. Okay. So next thing is you have to have a fit body. I'm not talking about bodybuilder. Just have a genuinely fit body. Okay. Do little push-ups, do little walking, do little jogging. Uh, keep your The best way to know whether you're a good graphologist is to see your stomach. If your stomach is good quality, it means it's relatively flat and you don't have too much of a paunch and you got no flabby skin, that's the best way to understand you're a good, good graphologist. Because you need to have a strong core in your body to have a... A stable mind. A stable mind can accept new thought patterns much easier. If you have a flimsy abdomen, your stomach is not good, your torso is not healthy, then you'll be weak in the mind. And the mind, once it's weak, it becomes prejudiced. It wants to think in only a certain manner. So do a bit of crunches, do a little abs exercise and see your skill improve. <laughs> okay. Next question is, uh, please comment on graphology and personal relations. Okay, so could you specify what exactly you want me to comment on graphology and personal relationship? Do you want me to know how to analyze them or how to handle them? Like, what is the nature of the question? Be a little more specific. Okay. This has really been fun today. Wonderful questions. It's so exciting. Thank you very much. It's almost like I'm not inviting you to listen to what I have to say. I'm inviting you so that I'm able to make my mind a mental gym, a men mental workout. And I'm so happy that you are here to question me so that I can make my mind run. It feels so alive. It feels so like like firecrackers in the mind. Okay. So next question here is, can you improve immunity through graphotherapy? Yes. The most important way to improve immunity of the body. I'm talking about physical immunity. Like your diseases on how to get how to avoid this is to reduce stress levels you have how much of medicines you want you do whatever exercise you want you do whatever yoga you do all the things which you want in your life but if you don't cut down the stress factor none of these things will matter okay because stress is the most is the is the biggest you could say dagger or the sword to the immune system if you remain calm, even in the difficult time of the sickness and illness, your body can manage it. 
you have medicine with stress and you have the same medicine without stress you see the difference in the healing okay so the okay so can graphology help managing family relationships and spouse relationships yes but first of all you need to have a better relationship with yourself the person who has good relationship with themselves they can be fine with anybody okay normally when you have problem with another person it's what you have a problem with that person about something that you can't handle about yourself so let's say for example you see a person who's getting let's say your spouse or your cousin brother sister uncle auntie mom dad whoever they are family members you can't escape them you have to be with them now they get too angry too often so it's because you can't handle your own anger or you are not able to manage your own anger that's why you will not be able to manage other people's anger if you can handle your own anger you know how to manage this anger then handling the other person's anger is not not a difficult task you can't handle the other person's argumentative nature you try to handle your own argumentative nature and see if that replicates in fact i feel that you know like there's a proverb friends are the family members you select and family members are the friends that are gifted to you now either the friend family member is bad to you or good to you good family members it's easy to deal with them I and there's nothing to deal much it's a happy go lucky thing but when a bad family member is there and you can't escape them you unfortunately related to them then you have to try to understand what is the life lesson behind this relation the moment you re- you learn the life lesson behind this bad relationship of a family member either the relation gets sorted or that negativity just moves away from you that family member who is not treated you well will just gently drift away from your from your communications from your day to day life and they just drift away so once you realize the nature of the true nature of why this person presence in your life is constantly happening what lesson does this presence of this negative person have in your life once the lesson is learned the problem gets automatically sorted it's not is a once you learn the lesson it will take minutes it takes a day and the person will be either sorted out with you or they'll be out of your life i mean they'll be distant okay unfortunately for some family systems their own mothers their own fathers their own sisters brothers cousins they start behaving oddly and then they ruin relationships remember how in your childhood some of their relationships felt so good but when you grew up you realize how bad and negative certain people were <laughs> it's almost like a shock to you but then you realize that children don't care about the negativity of the person they just be who they are and that brings out the joy in the other person which is so powerful you see sometimes a strict and uh, you know very uptight person when he comes in front of the child how he becomes mellow oh my little child googly googly so he says something cute to the child and again he responds back to the elder with again a serious face so that child has so much power to make the niceness come out of that strict person because of the child is just who he is so the brilliance of and the the simplicity of the innocence of the child is so powerful that it can make difficult people also at least consider an easy interaction okay so if you learn this from children and you manage your own self then bad relations become either better or they just drift away okay so that was a very interesting question i hope i didn't <laughs> ramble too much i sometimes i go into a flow of thought i hope it's useful to you thank you very much we've got just about 5 minutes left uh 
let's go for a couple of questions more how will you find grudge and deception very easily grudge and deception what the person is deceiving you with what's the grudge about it's very easy to understand you you have to detect where the pen flicks are the hooks are where the unnecessary loops are when the letter structure doesn't look like the letter structure it's supposed to look like all these are different forms of deception so yes in micrographology i teach this extensively all right so thank you very much are there any more questions are there any more uh, doubts queries or any topic in your mind then has to be a question just a thought in your mind express the thought on the chat and i'll see if it relates well to graphology i would like you all to stay tuned for coming february on february the 14th uh, normally we we have a lovely valentines day so i am going to reveal a new dimension of graphology which has never been explored at least by me and i would like the whole world i mean you are my world so i would like you all to benefit from this uh, new perspective of graphology which will be focused on relationships it's not easy to deal with relationships through graphology but there are certain things which i have been working on since last couple of years i have had i had testimonials of things working and i know things will work well so based on that i'll be revealing something new so on february 14th okay i'll be revealing something on about graphology life it will have to do something with relationships and caring and love and bonding with people who you care about okay so stay tuned for that lovely dovey session it will come up very soon okay all right so next question is what does it mean when the letter g looks like the number 8 so if your letter g looks like number 8 and if it's in connection on both the ends or at least at the starting it shows quick flow of thought quick nature of thinking about money and comfort zone and this flow of thought is very quick and fast and smooth now if it is not connected to the previous letter like if you write the word let's say uh, go and the first letter looks like a 8 instead of a letter g then that is manipulation that is complication so letter g that looks like a 8 in connection is a complement it's a quick nature of thought pattern smooth flow of thought pattern it's a positive thing but if it's the first letter of a word and still looks like a letter 8 i mean number 8 then uh, it's manipulation a manipulation of thoughts and sometimes it can be showing jumping to conclusions these people jump to conclusions in their comfort zone they over promise and tend to under deliver okay all right so thank you very much wonderful questions if there are more questions we'll attend to them next wednesday on the 9th of february see you again next time and uh, thank you very much if there are any more pending questions that may come after the video closes please connect with me directly and i'll be happy to answer to you thank you have a lo lovely wonderful evening morning afternoon wherever you are see you next wednesday